Dear everybody, welcome. On behalf of Biotech North, Cloud Cluster and ANSI Blue Legacy, welcome to our series of courses called Webimar. This is a series of educational seminar on marine ingredients for professionals. This is our third webinar, and today we meet PhD students who will present their research within analysis and utilization of marine resources. I am Janita, the project manager fisheries in NCA Blue Legacy, and I have the honor to do the opening words today. NC Blue Legacy had success in 2016 with a course in marine ingredients. In 2021, we wanted to share this opportunity for new knowledge with our cluster friends and their networks. The topic in the series are meant to support our cluster work in building knowledge on marine raw materials and value creation from these valuable food sources. I will soon give the word to Janna uh, from our course provider, Antia Anu, and she will inform more about the scope and value of this course and present today's speakers. But some of you are maybe not familiar with our clusters, so I will shortly say a few words about the three clusters collaborating here. Biotech North is a knowledge-based industry cluster located in Tromsø and serves the biotechnology and biomarine sectors in the entire northern part of the Norway. Uh, the cluster shall increase the commercialization of high-value products from residual raw materials, new marine resources, and marine bioprospecting. COD cluster is a national wide fish cluster with the purpose to increase value and discover new opportunities in the marine industries. NCE Blue Legacy is a business cluster for innovation and value creation based on marine raw materials. The cluster consists of national and international companies that cover the entire value chain from the fishing fleet and production of raw materials, processing technology, marketing activities, and R&D. So then some practical information about this webinar. Uh, we will record this webinar and make it available on our uh, YouTube channel and web pages. And please use chat for questions. Uh, questions will be addressed uh, to speakers after the lectures. Uh, and if there are more questions than we can handle here, we will answer these uh, after the course. Uh, uh, later, we will have a short break for 10 minutes. It's after our third presenter around 10.40. And the seminar will be ended at around 12.30 today. Uh, and also, um, we have a slide here for our next webinar uh, that Ivan will show you. Uh, we have a next webinar next week, September 8th. And the topic will be, uh, here you see it, uh, lax, ikke bare sashimi, men också luxusväskar og jern til skudd. Uh, in English, that would be salmon, not only sashimi, but also luxury bags and iron supplements. Uh, this webinar will be held in Norwegian, though. Uh, you will find more information about the program of that webinar on our web pages and in social media. So now I will pass the word to Janna from NTNU. Uh, she will be our moderator of today. Uh, so Janna, if you please introduce yourself and take over. Yes, thank you, Anita, for a nice presentation. So my name is Janna Kropotova, and I work as associate professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology here in Olesund. And today I will be your moderator. So as it was mentioned before, this session will be dedicated to PhD students and their research. Uh, we decided previously to organize this session because in order to follow the latest developments in the food industry, we need to look forward and to uh, see what we can do. So uh, PhD students are those uh, who are working 
in front of the of the food industry and uh, especially in the fish processing industry so they work um, with close contact with the industry uh, they know the needs of the industry uh, and uh, and they can um, improve the the industry request and needs uh, that related to different topics in the fish processing industry starting from uh, from um, lipid oxidation, protein uh, extraction, innovative methods uh, uh, for enzymatic hydrolysis, um, also topics related to white fish uh, handling, uh, consumer preferences. So we decided to gather here at this arena uh, um, several PhD students who will uh, represent uh, why topics in the fish processing industry. Uh, so uh, I give floor to first uh, speaker, uh, PhD student Elizabeth Cozzoni uh, from, um, uh, from the Department of Biological Sciences, uh, NTNU. And she will um, tell you about innovative uh, pretreatments uh, used for advanced extraction of lipid and protein compounds from fish restaurant materials. Uh, please, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Hi, um, I will share my presentation. Uh, so, um, as Jana said, my name is Elizabeth Kuzomi and uh, I am a PhD student at uh, the Department of Biological Sciences uh, of NTNU in Olesund. Uh, the topic of uh, my PhD is uh, innovative methods of uh, pretreatment used for advanced extraction of lipid and protein compounds from uh, fish restaurant materials. Uh, in general, the lipid and uh, protein fractions that are generated from uh, seafood processing constitute approximately 30 to 35% of the initial processed mass. In order to enhance the recovery of uh, valuable compounds uh, like uh, fish protein hydrolysis and fish oil. Excuse me. Oh, it's a lot of noise. Um, like fish protein hydrolysis and uh, fish oil, uh, innovative methods such as uh, high pressure processing pulse electric field and ultrasound can be applied. Uh, these are uh, non-thermal methods that uh, have been used uh, for decades uh, in the food industry and especially in food preservation, and they may assist the applied enzymatic extraction. Uh, the basic uh, principle of all these uh, methods is that uh, uh, it is based on the disruption of uh, the cell membranes prior to enzymatic treatment in order to enhance the enzyme and substrate interactions. Uh, that way, a maximum utilization of um, seafood side streams can be achieved through increased extraction of viable compounds, minimizing the amounts of fish uh, side streams. Uh, these uh, non-thermal uh, technologies are uh, successfully applied in the extraction of compounds from uh, feed side streams, but they have not been uh, studied uh, to a large extent. The, the scope of my project is the optimization of the methods for improved protein and lipid extraction from seafood side streams, applying these technologies as pretreatment prior to enzymatic hydrolysis. Uh, further, the stabilization of the obtained ingredients, which in my case are proteins and uh, fish protein hydrolysis and, uh, and oil, uh, will be achieved used, uh, using antioxidants. And finally, uh, the quality of these uh, products uh, will be assessed. Uh, then, uh, the, um, the main outcome of the, the research is the identification of the best technologies, both in production and stabilization, for its target group. Uh, so far, uh, the traditional uh, enzymatic hydrolysis consists of the following steps, uh, which are uh, the collection and uh, mincing of uh, fish side streams, uh, and uh, followed by the inactivation of endogenous enzyme using heated when this is needed. Uh, then the water and enzymes are added in the bioreactor and the hydrolysis takes place. After that, 
the product is safe to remove bones and other parts that couldn't be cleaved by the enzymes during hydrolysis. Next, the added enzymes inact are inactivated using heat. And finally, the product is centrifuged, leading to four fractions, the oil, fish protein, emulsion, and sludge. So uh, in our case, uh, the pretreatment of the samples uh, using innovative technologies, either ultrasound, high pressure, and uh, pulse electric field, is placed between the mincing of the side streams and the inactivation of endogenous enzymes. The rest of the procedure, as you can see, is the same as the traditional uh, enzymatic hydrolysis. So far, I have been working with um, high pressure uh, processing uh, treatment. Later, I'm going to continue with a study of uh, the effect of ultrasound and uh, pulse electric field. Uh, so uh, for now, the used raw material was uh, a whole gutted fish, a mixture of uh, trout and uh, salmon. The utilized enzymes were papain and bromelain and natural antioxidants were added for the stabilization of the, ingredient, of the obtained ingredients. Uh, in order to determine the long-term effect of uh, the high pressure pretreatment and the stability of the oil and uh, the protein, a storage experiment was conducted, conducted starting from zero day and followed by two weeks, four weeks, and finally uh, two months, eight weeks. Uh, the following uh, table shows uh, the pretreatment that was uh, applied in the samples. The pressure was uh, low, high, and uh, low, moderate, and high, with different exposure times of the sample in, the applied, uh, in the applied pressure. And of course, we had one control, which was the untreated uh, sample. So uh, the samples were six, it's one for its uh, treatment, uh, plus uh, the control. So uh, here in this figure, uh, you can see how the samples, uh, it, maybe it's not very clear from, uh, from the picture, but um, it shows how was um, the mince product after, uh, right after the pretreatment with uh, high pressure uh, processing and just before starting the hydrolysis. Uh, what I observed was that uh, with the highest uh, uh, treatment using the highest pressure, the product was a bit more pink. Uh, this may be due to aggregation of the proteins. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, normally during uh, traditional hydrolysis, when the product is saved before the part of the inactivation of the enzymes, in order to remove bones and other parts that were not cleaved by the enzymes. Um, as you can see by the control, is only bones. Uh, but uh, in the case of the treated samples, um, there is a denaturated products that is uh, obtained and um, the amount of it increases in proportion to the pressure and exposure of the time of the sample in the treatment. So in this, uh, in the higher uh, pressure, I had 600 for eight minutes. I got the, the largest, the maximum amount of um, product that could not be cleaved. This was due to the denaturation uh, from the pressure treatment. So at this uh, point, I'm going to show you a few, uh, just a few of uh, my results, preliminary results. Uh, starting uh, from the obtained uh, protein and oil uh, fraction gained after the centrifugation. As far as the oil is concerned, uh, the only treatment uh, that led to higher yield compared to the control was uh, the treatment 200 megapascal uh, for uh, four minutes. Um, the, regarding uh, the protein fraction, no significant differences were observed uh, between control and uh, the treatments 200 uh, megapascal for eight minutes, 400 megapascal for four minutes, and 600 megapascal for four minutes again. The rest were significantly lower compared to the control. So, uh, regarding the um, oxidative stability of the oil, uh, primary oxidation products are much higher, as you can see, 
in the samples where uh, moderate and high pressure uh, processing was applied compared to the control and the sample with the lowest treatment, which is 200 megapascal for four minutes. After two months of uh, storage, the lowest treatment uh, shows a tendency to lower peroxide value compared to the control, but this difference is not statistically significant. Uh, for the secondary oxidation uh, products, uh, uh, T-bars was uh, used. Uh, as you can see, again, it's pretty similar to the um, situation we had with the primary oxidation products. Uh, the secondary oxidation products are much higher in the samples where high and moderate uh, pressure processing was applied compared to control and the sample with the lowest uh, treatment, which is 200 megapascal for four minutes. After two months uh, storage, the lowest treatment shows a tendency to lower T-bars value compared to the control. But this difference, again, is not statistically significant. Um, thus, taking into account the oxidative stability of uh, the pretreated samples, it could be seen that probably the sample with uh, the lower treatment uh, showed equally uh, quality equal or uh, even better than the control. And um, this treatment also was the one that gave uh, the higher yield uh, regarding the oil. Uh, in this figure, uh, you can see the amount of uh, the free fatty acids uh, in the oil. Uh, it can be observed that the percentage of free fatty acid is significantly higher in the samples where a low pressure was applied compared to the samples treated in moderate and higher uh, pressure. And uh, this can, could be explained by the fact that the lipases that are inactivated during uh, the pretreatment with uh, the high pressure. So they, were, they are not able to um, break down uh, triglycerides into free fatty acids at the same extent. Uh, therefore, control shows higher amount of free fatty acids compared to the treated samples. And uh, finally, I'm going to show you uh, uh, one figure uh, from uh, uh, the degree of hydrolysis um, uh, of uh, free product hydrolysates. Um, there is uh, no significant difference uh, between the untreated samples and control, uh, meaning that um, all the parameters of uh, hydrolysis were uh, kept uh, for all the samples. And almost uh, all the treatments didn't show significant differences uh, during uh, storage. So uh, if you are interested uh, in uh, our research and uh, you could like to have uh, more information about uh, the project, you can just um, feel free to contact me. So thank you for uh, your attention. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. It was a really interesting uh, presentation. And uh, let's see what kind of questions we have uh, in the chat. Uh, so we have, um, uh, okay. We have uh, just good morning from, from Berlin. Okay, this is, this is another one. So uh, we are now waiting for some questions. Uh, so uh, I have a question to you, uh, regardless of the fact that I'm your supervisor. Uh, I, I just wonder, so after uh, conducting all this research, uh, what um, treatment would you suggest uh, for the industry or also research uh, institute uh, to extract more oil without affecting its quality? Uh, I think it was... Uh pretty obvious also from uh, the slides I have shown that uh, the most promising uh, method is uh, using 200 megapascal for uh, four minutes because uh, that in that case uh, there is some um, uh, disruption of the cells but without destroying the product. So we can have increase in the yield but without destroying the oxidative stability which is the most important uh, uh, for the oil to keep a good quality during storage. 
And uh, even though it was increased after two months a bit, still it was very low compared to the rest of the, uh, of the treatment where we was applied higher, much higher pressure. Also, I was thinking that um, on that uh, pictures that you showed us, the pale pink color for the samples treated with high pressure processing uh, can also suggest the fact that maybe it was uh, some degradation of astaxanthin because it's also linked to, to proteins. Mm -hmm. So since we had the um, aggregation yeah. of some mm -hmm. proteins and maybe therefore, yes. so maybe we didn't have mm -hmm. so much, yes, we did have uh, aggregation of proteins. Yes, it was obvious, but at the same time we have degradation of color due to degradation of astaxanthin. So we have uh, some questions from the, uh, from the listeners. Uh, the first one is from Rasa, from Sintef. Where does oil go as oil yield was lower comparing mm -hmm. to control? Uh, this, this, uh, this is what I'm working uh, at this uh, point. I'm analyzing, uh, um, all, I kept all the fractions and I'm analyzing the protein, the oil and uh, uh, dry matter and us in all the fractions to see uh, where um, oil and protein went uh, during this uh, pre this uh, pretreatment, but this oil I saw was the, the oil I took uh, after right after the centrifugation. So yeah, soon I will have uh, an answer for this. But uh, now I'm uh, I'm still conducting a few of experiments. I'm not fully done, so. I have hypothesis that this. maybe maybe this oil is uh, a bit increased in um, emulsion fraction, but you will analyze and you will see, Elizabeth. Yes, mm. the study is still in progress. We have uh, plenty experiments, and you saw that experiment is uh, huge, so it was not possible to analyze uh, everything. We, Elizabeth is still conducting. Yes, uh, a lot of experiments. So uh, we have another question from Rasa. Uh, how much emulsion did you get, Elizabeth? Yes, uh, uh, in general or um, in this. I think after uh, I think after in this the treatment. treatment. Yes, in this, this treatment. In this treatment, two hundred and four. Uh, okay, let me open my results because I don't have this slide. Uh, give me a moment. So uh, the emulsion, I uh, think, if I'm not mistaken, yes, it was um, uh, 63, uh, 63 grams. Per, uh, from, 63 from grams. Out, out of one kilo. kilo out of one kilo uh, raw material plus one kilo of, uh, of water. Okay, the next question comes from Rahil. What were the molecular weight of the peptides if you have it? Actually, we are yes, going actually, to conduct. Yes, yes. this is uh, what I was uh, discussing with Jana yesterday because we don't have this equipment here uh, in Olesund. Uh, I have to do it uh, in my uh, second supervisor at Uridrus in Trondheim. And um, because there are many things running there and students, uh, since spring, I was uh, trying to find the uh, time to analyze this. So this is something I will I have to do during September. I hope uh, Turid will agree. Yes, yes, of course. Because I need these results as soon as possible as well. I have this uh, the same question about the molecular size of the peptides. Uh, we have next question from Levrievilla from Sintef. What antioxidants was used? And uh, okay, and then it's uh, yeah. next section. Yeah. Uh, the ex antioxidants I used was uh, chamomile and uh, oregano. And uh, in an earlier experiment I, I ran before, I with several uh, natural antioxidants, I saw that those two showed the higher antioxidant activity. So I decided to use those two. And the reason why I used those two was that I didn't have enough antioxidant from only oregano or chamomile. So I, 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 want, I made um, a mixture of those 
of those uh, antioxidants with uh, the higher um, antioxidant activity. Yes. We have next question from Rasa. Did you get less emulsion in pretreatment compared to control? Um, let me check. Um, yes, it was much less. It was much less. And uh, with the, the, the process I, I followed during uh, the, the, extra, the, the extraction of all these fractions, I assume that uh, I, I tried to take as much of the oil and the protein of the emulsion as possible. So in general, I didn't have that much emulsion in all cases, but indeed the control showed the higher emulsion, the higher emulsion compared to the rest of the treatment. For all, all the treatments, yeah? Yes, yes, it was higher, much higher compared to the rest. The, the rest of the treatment showed uh, less, uh, much less emulsion. And in some cases, for example, in, in treatment, um, 400 megapascal for eight minutes, I only got 20 grams out of one kilo of sample plus one kilo of water. Yeah. These things should be analyzed actually, uh, because it's really interesting, and mm -hmm. I com I uh, totally agree with Ras and uh, Rivila. Yes, and also Ras uh, is uh, writing interesting. You yes. need to find where mm -hmm. all disappear. Yes, yes. this is yes. this is the analysis I'm doing right now. I am analyzing the different uh, fractions for uh, the oil, fish protein, and dry matter, and us to see where it was distributed. Yeah, because we also kept the, the mm. sludge, so maybe mm. it went to sludge. Yeah, yeah. I uh, assume I assume that mostly it could go to sludge, because my much. protein, my protein as well, because I have started with the extraction process. The 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 oil I'm taking is almost uh, chloroform, and I assume that um, I guess that most of the oil uh, went to sludge. Uh, we have next question from Rachel, and st since we have time, so I'm taking the questions. How did you dry the protein fraction? Uh, we were using a uh, uh, freeze uh, freeze dryer after right after uh, the extraction uh, after the centrifuge when uh, I iso isolated uh, the, the proteins the protein fraction. I stored uh, at least for 24 hours in minus 80. And then we put in the freeze uh, dryer until we get uh, powder with no ice uh, crystals inside. So the next question was, was, is from Revilla. So it was commercial antioxidant use, or have you noticed if the oil color was affected by the pretreatment? No, no, the oil color was not affected by the pretreatment because I took also pictures from uh, all my samples. Uh, they were the color was the same. It didn't change anything. Yes, and we conducted actually color yes. analysis. Yes, yes, so exactly. There yes. were no we differences. Also, no, no, no. Yes, but uh, the first question was: it commercial antioxidant used? Uh, no, it, we, no, we used no. because we used um, um, the natural antioxidant yes. extracted uh, by the university yes. of. Uh, uh, Croatia, from I think? Croatia, yes, yeah. uh, of Zagreb, yes, yes. yes. So it was, um, uh, it was fresh uh, antioxidant extract with a very uh, strong antioxidant activity. Yeah, and they uh, extracted this anti antioxidant actually by using also a pulse electric field. So, yes. Okay, do we have uh, other questions? Uh, if not, then um, thank you. Okay, no, there is a question also from Russ, and we have some time, so I take it. I would suggest to show the yield of all four fractions. So may I uh, answer you, Russ, since I'm a supervisor of Elizabeth. Yesterday we were discussing what to show and not what to show at this webinar. Since it's this, uh, uh, this is uh, your uh, second year PhD, and uh, we are planning now to publish. We didn't want to disclose all the information. Uh, before she, she, she at least, uh, um, at least it's uh, under review. Uh, so uh, she has this um, picture of all four fractions, but uh, due to some reasons, uh, we didn't want to disclose it. 
Uh, we we added uh, we decided to add um, the most important, which was the oil and uh, and the protein. Otherwise, I have a lot of that. This this is just a few. I wanted to to show you. But so, in private, in private, if you're interested, you can mm -hmm. contact us, and yes. Elizabeth will send you yes. this information. Yes, of course. It's just not to, to show to the white public. Sorry. Uh, because it's really yes. new, new research, as you see. But we open for collaboration and we can send to you, Rasanova. Of course. Yes, okay. Do we have uh, other questions? No. So then, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. We see very You're interesting. Very interesting presentation. I'm happy there are uh, some interest uh, from our public. Uh, from researchers actually and now uh, we can um, start with the next speak speaker uh, and uh, to learn more about uh, uh, the, um, the situation in the Norwegian whitefish industry, uh, the problems, the challenges and uh, how we can promote sustainable development. Uh, so I want to uh, introduce Veronika uh, Hammer Yelnes uh, from NTNU, from uh, from the Department of uh, Biotechnology and Food Sciences. Uh, we've been uh, largely also uh, collaborating together, and I know Veronika for many years. She is very good researcher, and I'm sure she will tell you uh, a lot of interesting things uh, from the whitefish industry. So please, Veronika, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jana. I'm going to share my presentation with you now. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. My name is uh, Veronika Jelnes and I'm a PhD student. And uh, this presentation will probably be a bit different from the other ones you will see today, uh, as I will try to present some new perspectives to look at the problems we are facing. And um, I will share with you the results of my research, which has been on how we can improve the utilization of whitefish restaurant materials, and also how partnering with the whitefish industry can promote sustainable development. So, as many of you know, whitefish, it is a collective term for the species cod, sait, uh, ling, tusk, and haddock. And my work has mainly been on uh, sait, let's call him the less famous and valuable brother of cod. Poor thing. Um, he um, or from whitefish, we uh, when we, we are, when we are processing whitefish, as much as two thirds of the fish end up as restaurant materials. So restaurant materials that is basically everything that is not the main fo food product that we are processing, uh, and that is in most cases the fillet. So that means that restaurant materials are heads, backbones, viscera, and uh, yeah, other components. Um, and in Norway, we produce approximately 300,000 tons of restaurant material each year. And of this, 40% ends as waste, while 60% goes to uh, production of um, various low value products, mainly bio or animal feed and biogas. And this is not only bad for the environment, but we are also wasting a lot of excellent nutritional components, like good quality proteins, omega-3 fatty acid, vitamins, and minerals that we could other, otherwise use. And uh, so I wanted to study how we can improve this utilization of respirable material. And to do this, I wanted to see if we could use biotechnological processing. But I also wanted to see what factors could enable or complicate the process of industrializing this technology. So in other words, I wanted to take a step back and see the bigger picture and how everything is connected. So my search for factors that might affect the potential to improve the utilization of whitefish restaurant material has involved both working in the laboratory uh, with upscaling or controlled upscaling uh, towards industrial scale from lab scale equipment, uh, but also it has involved working with less traditional methods of technology development. 
And I have used interviews and qualitative analysis to extract valuable information that we can obtain from Fisher's experience-based knowledge. And so today I will present to you a bit of my findings from the lab, but also uh, the results of a case study where I was so lucky uh, that I got the opportunity to interview eight fishers of the coastal fleet in Norway. So um, in the laboratory, I wanted to investigate how we could extract the protein content of say heads and backbones and how we could uh, uh, develop a protein product from this that was suitable for human consumption, um, fish snacks or fish snacks. Um, and to do this, I wanted to use enzymatic hydrolysis and membrane filtration. So in short, enzymatic hydrolysis, it is a process where you utilize the activity of enzymes that is either present in the raw material itself or added. In my case, I added them from pineapple and, um, and papaya. And then you cut up the protein into smaller peptides, which can then be extracted into a water-soluble base. And in addition to extracting these proteins, I also wanted to check other um, functional properties of them and um, besides um, that could be health promoting besides um, being a source of amino acids. So I looked at bioactivity and more specifically if peptides can function as antioxidants. So let's take a look at what happened in the laboratory. Um, I wanted to investigate, as I said, how we could best extract the uh, protein content of uh, say, head and backbones. And the first thing I did then was to homogenize um, the, the rest of materials, grinded it into a fish mince that is uh, presented in this picture. And then I added my mince into bioreactors, which is basically advanced casseroles. I like to think of them as advanced casseroles, where you can control temperature and pressure and um, pH. So it's a very controllable process, and it's a bit bigger than working in smaller scale. And after I had conducted the processing, I was able to extract proteins into a protein powder, or it's a water-soluble protein phase that can be dried down to this protein powder that you see here. Uh, and after I did that, I wanted to use membrane filtration to separate the peptides by size. Uh, and uh, what I did then was that I used something that is called a membrane filtration. It's, that is also a pilot scale um, equipment that we have in the lab and Karchina in Trana. Uh, and this is um, yeah, more or less an advanced sieve that lets small peptides through and holds large one, larger ones back. So the larger peptides I wanted to utilize for their functional properties, like water binding, gelling, and such. And with, together with bachelor students, it's a very fun project. We actually made the both merengue, bread, and fish cakes uh, containing these protein powder. And um, believe it or not, it tasted quite good. So um, that was very interesting. And uh, the smaller peptides, I wanted to check for bioactivity, which I can do further analysis on. But today I am not going to present so many detailed results for you um, about analysis of different fractions and, and that we will probably see more of uh, in the rest of the uh, presentations. But I thought we could look at something that I think is very interesting from a perspective where you think about this technology actually going out to the industry. And that is what happens to the protein during this processing. So this figure that you can see here, it represents what happens to 100 grams of seed head and backbone. And that contains, uh, head contains, for example, like you see here, 16 grams of protein. And um, <clears throat> after the hydrolysis here, uh, we end up with approximately 30 to 40% of the protein in the hydrolysis. And after the hydrolysis, I run it through two filtrations. One, named 150 here, which is with large pores just to remove impurities, and then to a smaller, through a smaller one, where the purpose is basically to separate the bio or the smaller part that I suspected to be have higher bioactivity from the larger ones. And after two filtrations, I ended up with approximately 
of what we started out with in the permeate here, which is the term used for the, um, the fluid that runs through the filtration, which contains the smallest peptides. So what does this really mean in an industrial setting? Well, every step you add to a process, an industrial process, it means added costs, right? Extra time, extra equipment. And so in order to make the processing um, beneficial from an economic perspective, the final product should ideally have a higher market value than what you started out with. And what is more from a sustainability perspective, it is important to consider the total reduction in restaurant materials, right? Because it's no point if I start utilizing restaurant materials and what I utilize is merely the 10% down here. That is no point. So we also have to look at finding applications for the other fractions as well. And as you can see, a lot of protein ends up in the secondary fractions of both enzymatic hydrolysis and from, um, uh, and from the filtrations. And uh, the sludge here, which is the insoluble fraction from the enzymatic hydrolysis, that could be used for gelatin extraction, for example. And the larger peptides, which I mentioned earlier, could be used for food products. And uh, yeah, I think it's now time to move out of the lab. So uh, I wanted to combine this experience that I had from the lab and this knowledge I gained from the lab with the experience-based knowledge of fishers. But how can we then obtain such knowledge, structure it and extract the topics that are relevant for our technology development, right? So what I found is that here, traditional methods of natural science had really no use. I needed to use methods that were commonly practiced by social sciences, which includes observation studies and interviews, and to use data from this to make more general assumption and theories, and this is known as qualitative analysis. And I was lucky enough to find eight participants, fishers, um, that wanted to talk to me. And I talked to them for I, about one hour each. And um, I asked them very open-ended questions to facilitate a good conversation that they felt that they could express themselves uh, in. And these interviews were recorded, uh, recorded and further transcribed. Uh, before they were analyzed. And I analyzed them using a method that is called thematic analysis. And the point of this type of analysis is to extract the themes from all the interviews that cover as much as what is talked about as possible. So I'm going to go through with you now, um, just briefly mention the three themes that I was able to extract. Um, there, I could, of course, discuss them forever, but just to mention them um, quickly. Uh, the first one, the first one I termed the all is well with the fish, the incomprehensible term sustainability. And the reason why I found this theme is that whenever the participants were asked about stuff about sustainability, they directly uh, connected these uh, sustainability to uh, a good monitoring of the stocks. So that means that for them, as long as the fish capture is um, kept to a moderate level, the, the process or the, the industry is sustainable and the utilization is sustainable. And that is not necessarily what, for example, I think about when I think about sustainable utilization. And uh, I think this was very interesting and, and it will be very interesting to take into consideration when we are, uh, when we are developing technology. The second theme that, I, uh, that was identified was that it is us and then there is them, the fragmented value chain. And it became very clear to me from the interviews that we are talking about a very fragmented value chain for the whitefish industry. And this can result in a lot of um, effects that could be negative or could be positive, but at least it's important to consider all these effects because, first of all, it's, um, it could create a loss of responsibility uh, from the different stakeholders and, and also a loss of control of product quality 
uh, but also a tension between the stakeholders if they feel like they are not part of a continuous line, but more like this is us and that is them. And the last team I identified uh, was we are not seen and heard, the loss of recognition. And the interviews also clearly reflected a feeling of not being seen or heard, both by regulatory authorities, but also by the society in general. So I could, uh, I, I want to talk about this uh, a lot more, but uh, I think I need to round up now and uh, summarize a bit the results from the laboratory experiments and that's from the interviews. So what factors could affect the potential to improve the utilization of whitefish restroom material? The upscaling experiments in the laboratory it gave an indication of the technical issues that needs to be considered when moving this technology into the industry. So first of all, fish heads and backbones are tough and rigid materials so that they will require powerful equipment for mincing, but also for agitation with a homogeneous mixture. Uh, and the raw product from the enzymatic hydrolysis, it's a, it's a water um, or it's a, a water phase with relatively small amounts of uh, protein dissolved into it. So we also need energy and cost efficient dewatering technology to make this process feasible for the industry. And membrane, membrane filtration was also a time consuming process. Um, and it, in my studies, it didn't uh, give the result or it, the, the increase in by uh, antioxidative activity wasn't enough to uh, sort of say that this is should be applied in the industry or it will be economically um, feasible to do that. So, but this of course was just preliminary study. So we need to study more about membrane filtration as a technology. And a deep dive into the Fisher's experience-based knowledge resulted in the identification of several issues, as you saw including the use of uh, exclusive and complicated language that might not mean the same for all those involved. And that could hinder us, right, from moving. If we want to move towards a common goal, it is hard to move in the same direction if we are not, do not all have the same understanding of what that goal is. And the fragmented value chain, it's problematic from many viewpoints but also uh, the implementation of regulations that does not necessarily function as well in practice as in theory. And then when there is a lack of incentives, maybe a complete lack of incentives, is it then fair to expect a change? So with my research, what I hope to do is to show that partnering with the whitefish industry in different ways than we are doing now, um, is the only way that we can fully understand the complexity of the challenges we are facing so that we together can find um, more uh, the best solutions for a more sustainable future. So I hope this has been, or at least I've given you some new perspectives and things to think about. And I hope you can, or I hope you, I encourage you to ask me questions and to contact me if you want to discuss uh, this matter further. So thank you so much. Thank you, Veronica. It was really amazing presentation. I, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I'm sure our listeners enjoy it as well. And we have um, several questions. Uh, so uh, the first one, um, uh, the first one, uh, uh, yes, uh, from Monica. Uh, so how did you dry the hydrolysate? Did you experience any problems during drying due to hydrolysis degree? Um, I dried them uh, the same way as uh, Elizabeth um, described. I froze them down and I freeze dry them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I didn't uh, actually investigate the degree of hydrolysis uh, before or and after uh, the freeze drying. But um, uh, from what I have, uh, or from pre previous studies, it doesn't seem to affect it that much. It's uh, quite a gentle freezing technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, actually, I agree with Bonica because I had similar question. What I know uh, also from, from before and what, what I saw from before, when you uh, freeze dry uh, low molecular weight fractions of proteins, peptides, then you don't receive powder, you receive like a paste. Did you experience this, Veronica? 
No, actually, I did not. Uh, it okay. was quite powdery. Um, okay. I, uh, when I yeah, when I extracted it from the boxes that I dried uh -huh. in, it, uh, uh -huh. it was quickly turned into a powder just by yeah. Okay. So, uh, but I, I know what you're talking about. I have yeah. experienced maybe, the same. <laughs> maybe it's uh, only when we cleave until uh, until uh, amino acids. But it's really <laughs> interesting. We will discuss it further. So, <laughs> but we have uh, more questions. Uh, so, uh, you talk about the quality of raw material. Have you studied different fisheries equipment? So, trolls, uh, long line, and difference in frozen and fresh material? I am not studying. Uh, I would really like to study, uh, but I have, uh, um, uh, what means in theory, I have uh, looked at the different uh, and made some thoughts about or uh, assumptions or hypotheses uh, about the different. Uh, uh, but for my, um, it, what was most important for me is to acknowledge all the different uh, capture methods that exist and to uh, that the, all these can also affect the quality and that we also need to make adjustments depending on the type of catch we are face or the boats are using. Hmm. Is, um... Yes, thank you. The next question uh, is pineapple and papaya as enzymes in which form? So you need to <laughs> <laughs> explain. <laughs> Extracted in powder form, not uh, by throwing in. Uh, yes, I assume you use papaya and bromelain the same I as did. we use. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. The next question uh, again from Monica. When you say that uh, so much of fish ends up as waste, uh, what do you mean by that? What happens to it? Uh, it could be different things. Uh, it could be uh, thrown overboard. It could be lost in the value chain. Um, and uh, yeah, but waste then it's not used for anything. While uh, that what is ut utilized is used for yeah, biogas and, and animal feed. And some small fractions for uh, human consumption. But here I have a question. You said that it can be thrown or, uh, from the board. But uh, now we have this land uh, feel, um, how it's called, uh, yes, um, agreement, you know, and also in Europe that from uh, 2019, you're, you're not allowed to do it anymore. So what mm. happens then? I mm. think in Norway, they respect this uh, legislation. They do. Uh, but uh, sometimes it is uh, practically impossible. And uh, some, um, if they, uh, let's say, at least uh, when they are gutting the fish, uh, some equipment is just, um, yeah, adapted to sending it back uh, into the ocean. Um, but uh, again, uh, what I'm looking at is, yeah, um, it's um, it's very complicated to to we, we both need to develop the correct technology, but we also need to take into consideration like all the practical issues that um, comes with that technology. Yes. Yeah. We have more questions from Synthov side. So Rasa is first. Uh, why did you use homogeniz homogenization for raw material? It could create emulsion, which is not mm. desirable. Mm. Uh, I used it because uh, it, um, or under the assumption that it would be easier to extract more protein. Um, I know that uh, yeah, has conducted the allergy chopped uh, the, the backbone. That could also be. Um, I didn't really, my uh, the aim of my project was not to investigate the hydrolysis as a process and to adopt different processing uh, parameters. So I just chose that one and one concentration and one temperature, and then tried more to focus on the bioreactors and how these could be compared. So yes, um, I think we need to, or it's important to look into what could, because mincing, of course, adds an additional step into the processing and it's also quite uh, hard to process uh, this western material. So if it, it could be done without mincing, yes. Uh, and the next question from Revilla, when you used membrane filtration, have you observed uh, if the lipid amount in the hydrolysate was affected? Um, yes, it was affected from the um, 100 and um, when I showed the, the, the large pore uh, filtration, the 150 kilodaltons, it was uh, less lipids afterwards, after the preliminary filtration. So that was um, mm, desirable. <laughs> 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 That's really interesting with this membrane uh, filtration. Mm -hmm. The next question from Rasa, what would be the most uh, profitable products produced from restaurant materials as fractionation and membranes increase the price and reduce the yield drastically? 
Yeah, uh, I think uh, just from market value pricing, uh, the most valuable products would be to have the bioactive peptides, right? But this again is a very um, tough process and it's, uh, it will take a lot of work to get there. Uh, because we don't, we not only have to prove the antioxidative activity, but it, we also need to conduct uh, preclinical and clinical studies. And, and many of you are probably familiar with the health claims or the rules for health claims and novel foods. And uh, this is not an easy uh, regulatory framework to break to sort of. So I would say right now, maybe actually fish protein hydrolysates uh, could be. Um, uh, yeah, are, are marketed and could be marketed and to, for human consumption and also gelatin, uh, I think it's a very high promising uh, direction. Mm, totally agree. And we have the next question. Uh, legislation was discussed with the fishers. Can you say a bit more about this, the challenges that the fishers are experiencing? Yes, I could. Um, uh, well, not going into too much detail to avoid the uh, yeah, uh, but uh, what I found that they were most, uh, let's say, uh, felt most um, stressed about was the fact that this Elon Fering's brick, this um, uh, you have to bring all the raw material that you catch back to the shore. This was a rule that was uh, a regulatory framework that was um, uh, put into action a few years ago. and. Now uh, they are being guarded by the Coast Guard, many of them report, and, and they have been made this like scapegoat um, where they are being, they feel like they are being followed, they feel like they are being monitored, but they still don't receive any incentives like financial aid to bring the uh, rest of materials back to shore, but they are being monitored. And, um, I also heard ex examples from boats being bored by the Coast Guard. Oh, uh, yeah, they were um, really not treating them very nice. Oh, um, so that and also the quota, quota system, which changed, we said, which from my understanding has, um, it changes a lot when the government uh, changed or like every fourth year or so. They, they make what they think are minor changes, but for the fishers that could mean like they maybe invested a lot of money in a boat because it was more beneficial to have two sets of quotas and then suddenly that is not uh, possible or it's not um, possible to do that anymore. So then they have to sell that boat and to take both back. So the quota system and um, yeah, the uh, Elon Ferry speak. Mm. Yes, very interesting. Uh, we have some time uh, before uh, the start of the next speaker, and I have practical question um, related to hydrolysis, uh, but actually related to membrane filtration. Veronica, did you observe any color change after the membrane filtration generally? So, if you compare before and after, and if you compare if you compare the low molecular weight fractions and high molecular weight fractions, do you see color change between the, those two fractions as well? Uh, yeah, um, I see uh, uh, it's it's much the, the yeah it's much clearer, uh, less yellowy uh, after the filtration, uh, and also between them. But that is it's kind of hard to say because there are also less peptides in the fluid that runs through, which exactly. also makes the yeah color less um, uh, op op opacity or reduces the opacity. Uh, but um, uh, the permeates, the, the, it's whiter uh, than the, than the hydrolysates, yes. But if you compare with commercial powder, um, does it have the same color as commercial powder or a bit yellowish? No, it's actually very pure. And that uh -huh. I think it's mainly, especially the one from the backbones. Um, and I also just, uh, I looked in my, uh, at seasonal variations and that is, um, um, also a benefit regarding that to use backbones and heads that do not vary so much depending on seasons uh, and, and, and of course the stability of these products compared to Evisra uh, due to the low levels of lipids and, um, and enzymes, endogenous enzymes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I, I um, uh, always wondered about uh, using uh, this uh, membrane filtration for hydrolysis. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, thank you again for your wonderful presentation and uh, answers uh, for our que uh, to our questions. And um, if uh, other people are interested, they can always contact Veronica. And we uh, go to the next speaker. Uh, this is uh, my colleague uh, from the Department of um, Biological Sciences, Olisund, uh, Christina. Uh, so uh, she uh, now finished her PhD, uh, but uh, and will have a lot of material to to present. Uh, so she will talk about the effect of using antioxidants to limit oxidation and to increase the storage stability of protein hydrolysates made from fish heads. Please, Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I think maybe something wrong happened. So do you see me? Okay. Yes. It's no, okay. I'm on. Yes. Um, I will talk about how uh, the oxidants can be used for a sustainable growth of the aquaculture industry. Uh, and as Janet said, I am finishing my PhD right now. Uh, and in this presentation, I will go to some of the challenges the industry have um, and also present some of my uh, some of my results. Uh, when we're talking about sustainability, I think everyone is aware that the population of the world is increasing uh, and it is also expected to increase. And this means that to be able to feed all the people, we need to uh, produce more food. Uh, and fish has a high level of um, both lipids and proteins, but today only one fifth of the global production of edible muscle food is produced from wild fish and from fish farming. And actually this accounts for only 6% of all the proteins that is consumed by humans. So there is a large room for improvement. Uh, the aquaculture represents an important industry in Norway and with Atlantic salmon and rainbow trout as the most important species. Uh, it is most often the fillets we are eat uh, and they are considered to be the main product of the fish. But when we fill fish and process it, we also get these rest raw materials, like the heads and frames and mascara or guts, but also we have blood, skins, belly flaps and trimmings. And in 2019, the production of salmon and trout was 1.5 million tons or a little bit more, where about 30% of this uh, was utilized uh, or classified as restaurant materials. Um, this is a quite high amount, but however, uh, it was only 6% that was used as uh, human consumption. The rest was used as pet food, fish feed, livestock fodder, and also to produce energy. From the rest raw material, we have or a large uh, high number of products may be made. Uh, a large uh, proportion of the rest raw material is not suitable for direct uh, human consumption. For example, we wouldn't just take a head from a trout and eat it like this. So therefore the protein and lipids must be extracted. And a suitable method for doing this is by enzymatic hydrolysis. And during the enzymatic hydrolysis, the proteins are breaking down to smaller peptides and also amino acids. Uh, and we get four or three uh, um, uh, fractions in my case because we didn't get or there were hardly none uh, emulsion in uh, our products, but we got the a lipid phase, which you can see as red color on the top. And we have the 
liquid protein phase in the middle as the yellow one and the sludge at the bottom. Um, some challenges or limitations for using the rest of material is the oxidation of lipids and proteins. Uh, there is already a huge amount of research done of lipid oxidation, but there is significantly less has been done on protein oxidation. But actually the first publications of protein oxidation was in the start of the 1900s. Uh, but then they took like a, it was a free radical and it reacted with the protein and then it destroyed the protein. That was the way it was. But today we know that the picture is more complicated and the protein oxidation will affect many of the properties of the protein. Um, for example, you see that you have uh, the protein oxidation will affect, also it will denaturate the protein, but the protein oxidation will also uh, affect the lipid oxidation and the lipid oxidation can go back to the protein denaturation. So this can cause rancid taste on the product, uh, off flavor, change in texture, and for example, a dry product and also reduced solubility. So the fact that the raw material of fish, especially fatty fish are prone to oxidation makes some challenges for the industry. In order to produce fish protein hydrolysates, storage and also transportation is often necessary. Uh, and although some of the slaughterhouses for salmon needs already have processing of rest raw material next door, um, as far as I know, there's only one um, that use enzymatic hydrolysis to process raw material into human food grade ingredients. Also, there is a risk of oxidation when the raw material needs to be handled, sorted and processed. And at last, there is also challenges in the enzymatic hydrolysis because the raw material is also exposed to elevated temperature, light and oxygen during the process. And these three aspects we wanted to get more knowledge about during my PhD. Uh, and therefore we set up two questions we wanted to study. Uh, it was how will a stored and oxidized rest raw material affect the properties of the protein hydrolysate? And the second one was how will antioxidants added in hydrolysis affect the final products and their storage stability? Um, and we come up with a hypothesis and that was that addition of antioxidants will limit both the lipid and protein oxidation and thereby improve the solubility and other properties of the protein. So we conducted two studies. Uh, in the first study, we wanted to use raw material in the hydrolysis uh, and the raw material should have not been um, fresh. So we made it raw material of three different qualities. Um, the first one, uh, the first raw material, we uh, hydrolyzed fresh. But the other two, we added um, pro-oxidants to make sure that the raw material was oxidized and then we store it for one week. And also for one of them, we added BHT, which is an antioxidant to the raw material along with the pro-oxidants. So to get a raw material that was less oxidized than the most oxidized one. Uh, and we did uh, enzymatic hydrolysis. Uh, I will not go through this process because I think both uh, Veronica and Elizabeth has gone through it already perfectly. And I use the same methods and the same um, enzymes. 
Um, and also we we analyzed the raw material, this tree, before uh, the hydrolysis. Uh, so we know that uh, all about the lipid oxidation and the protein oxidation uh, and the quality um, in these three raw material. But the re results I'm showing here today is only from the uh, protein hydrolysates. Um, all the prepared hydrolysates had high contents of protein, but their solubility differed. Um, almost all of the uh, proteins in the control group was soluble, 100%, but it decreased when we used this oxidized raw material. It was about 75% for both of them, and there was there wasn't any differences between the um, ox fully oxidized one and the one that we had added antioxidant in. We also saw that it was differences in the molecular weight distribution. Um, the oxidized raw material, the two last ones, um, resulted in hydrolysate with a higher proportion of the smaller peptides. The smaller peptides are shown in the upper um, part. So uh, when we used an oxidized raw material, then it caused the peptides to get smaller or it was a larger proportion of the, of the peptides that was smaller. Uh, we have often seen that uh, small peptides gives a higher solubility, but that was not the case in this work. Um, the sol solubility did not correlate to the level of protein oxidation in hydrolysate or the other properties of the hydrolysate. But the solubility was found to correlate to the state or the oxidative status of the raw material. Uh, and this shows that the quality of the raw material will be of importance uh, when we make uh, hydrolysates or protein hydrolysates. In addition, we saw that, uh, or we observed a significant darker color of the hydrolysates when a stored raw material was, was used. The first hydrolysate is from this control group uh, where the raw material was not stored. Uh, and this um, hydrolysate is made from the oxidized raw material where we added antioxidant. And the last one is the fully oxidized uh, raw material. Uh, and we also see that even though there was uh, not so large differences between the um, two last group uh, with and without antioxidant, um, even for the protein solubility uh, or the protein oxidation in the groups or the um, size of the peptides, we saw that the color of the um, hydrolysates where uh, antioxidant was added, it was a little bit less gray or brown. Uh, and the hydrolysates made from oxidized raw material still has high levels of essential amino acids. So with the use of right storage facilities and use of antioxidants, then it may have potential for use uh, for human consumption, even if we have to store it before production. For the second um, study, we used antioxidant in the hydrolysis to see if the antioxidants will interfere uh, with the hydrolysis or um, affect the uh, properties of the proteins. So we did a hydrolysis, uh, enzymatic hydrolysis from heads of trout and heads of salmon. Uh, and in the hydrolysis mixture, we added four different different uh, antioxidants. It was BHT, propylgalate, citric acid, and ascorbic acid. 
uh, and we dried the protein hydrolysates and we store them for up to six months. Uh, and they were stored in room temperature. Uh, and the results show that the antioxidant added during hydrolysis did not affect the solubility of the hydrolysates, uh, the amino acid distribution, or the size of the peptides. So it's likely that the antioxidant will not affect the enzymes we used. But on the other hand, the antioxidant did affect the tile groups which is the level of oxidation, protein oxidation, and it also affected the color of the hydrolysates. Uh, a very interesting case that we saw was that the solubility in salmon at trout, the solubility of proteins were different. For trout, almost all of the protein we had in the protein hydrolysate was soluble, but for salmon, uh, it was almost 80% that was soluble. Uh, and we don't have any solution or we don't know why this happened, but we have some theories. Uh, the first one is that uh, we know that uh, salmon uh, raw material, the heads, they contain more fat and often we have seen that the solubility is related to the amount of lipids in the raw material. And another theory we have was that there might be something in some of the species that are interfering with the method we used for solubility. Um, this is the results from the tile groups. Um, Tile groups is the protein oxidation. Um, we saw that the, also the, the level of tile groups was different in two species, where salmon had almost twice as much tile groups as the trout. Uh, and also we see that during the storage, the uh, tile groups went down. Uh, and this means that the uh, protein oxidation occur. And it was also during storage, only propyl galat that was capable to retain all the protein, um, uh, protein um, oxidation also to keep the quality good. Uh, this is just a picture of the hydrolysates. This is from Salmon. Um, this shows that the antioxidant will affect the uh, the color. Uh, I will not go to that one, but I, we see that ascorbic acid, maybe this is not um, not uh, so good solution for using uh, when this is going to be stored. And I will go to the conclusion. We saw that use of stored or oxidized raw material resulted in a fish protein hydrolysate with a high amount of essential amino acids, but it uh, decreased solubility compared to fish protein hydrolysate from raw material, which was not stored. We also saw that use of antioxidants did not affect the enzymatic hydrolysis, but it decreased the oxidation and it also improved the color of the fish protein hydrolysates. And depending on the antioxidant, a positive effect on color during storage was seen. And by using antioxidants, it is possible to utilize more of the resi residual wood, uh, material for human consumption. Yeah, that, I think that was all I have. Thank you very much, Christine, for your interesting uh, presentation. And before we go on to the questions, I want to tell to everyone that Christina has a huge experience with uh, hydrolysis. And now she is involved in the uh, European Yaranet project also on hydrolyzing of um, trout restor materials. And we accumulated a lot of hydrolysates and sludge, so we are going to analyze. And uh, I'm sure Christina will apply your knowledge in this European project as well. We'll continue this uh, area. So now we're going um, 
uh, we are going to the questions. So the first question uh, was from Raquel. Did you notice some smell changes with antioxidants? No, we didn't experience any differences. Okay, uh, then the, the next question was from uh, Monica. Is there any particular reason why you choose not to use BHT? BHA, sorry, BHA? No, no, it was just the first time we did it. So we just picked four actually. Uh, and we had no experience with any of them. So yeah, it was just a trial. Mm -hmm. So it could have been BHT. A also, so yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the next question is from Rasa. Uh, did you analyze amount of oil in um, uh, fish protein hydrolysates? Does it influence color? No, we didn't. We didn't check the amount in the fish protein hydrolysates. But I think that is some important thing to do next. Uh, just check to check if there should be any uh, influences. Yes, I, I, I think we need to do it in our project now. Yes, it's, this is very important. Yes, yeah, since we are more focusing on proteins. Uh, okay, uh, the next question is, which antioxidant would you, Christina, advise to add during hydrolysis of salmon restaurant materials? And let me continue, both including quality of oil and proteins. Uh, it depends because some of the uh, antioxidants uh, was better for the oil and Another ones were better for the uh, for the uh, protein, but maybe propylgalate because it gave the um, it gave the uh, uh, whitest uh, hydrolysates, uh, and it also worked well with the protein oxidation in a hydrolysate, but it also worked quite well with um, the oil fraction. But does so, it have a bleaching effect? Why you say it it, it gives more um, whiter effect? No, I I just I don't know if it has a bleaching effect. I think it's only that it maybe hinders some oxidation, um, and it doesn't get white during storage, but it keep uh, retain the color as it is okay. during all the months. Okay. Yes, thank you for the tips. Next question. The additives, antioxidants you used, did you check if they are approved for this food category? Um, actually, no. Um, but uh, I know that some of them are, uh, but I didn't check all, um, actually. But normally the antioxidants that yeah. we are using, the natural, mm -hmm. they are food grade antioxidants. Yeah. So, uh, in, and I want to just also to explain to, to them uh, to, to, for this question that um, normally if you use a green method, green method of extraction, and you extract um, um, antioxidants from natural res raw materials, then they're, they're considered food grade. But of course, if you're using uh, some chemical extraction and there are some uh, rest of uh, chemicals that there cannot be used. But I, I'm, I'm sure Christina used the natural antioxidants that are food grade. So that were uh, extracted with <clears throat> green, <clears throat> green methods. Okay, the next question, how does addition of antioxidant affect the protein content in the end product? There was no changes um, depending on the antioxidant. Uh, so the antioxidant did not um, uh, affect the, uh, the uh, protein um, uh, content. The next question from Monica, did you measure the emulsion phase? If yes, did various antioxidants affect the amount of emulsion? Uh, we hardly get anything after emulsion phase, uh, so we didn't uh, measure this one. Okay, uh, but uh, did, you, did you hear the difference between emulsion phase when you hydrolyzed the trout heads and you hydrolyzed? No, the same amount more it or was, less, it right? It was the same, yes. Okay, yes, but um, uh, I still um, wonder why it's so big difference between solubility of proteins in uh, a trout and, uh, and salmon. Uh, uh, we, we don't know. I, I also think that that is something that we need to, 
to check more on? Because tile groups show the opposite tendency. No, you had more tiles in salmon and less yes. in, in. So it should be the opposite. But yes, but it's true. Uh, but we don't know why this. That's, like that's this. really interesting. We need to yes. to analyze why. I, yeah. I still I'm thinking what would be the, the reason for that. And uh, but uh, you, Christina, do you think it's better your your own opinion after hydrolyzing um, trout head and salmon thread? What would be uh, better as raw material to obtain um, high quality hydrolysates, trout heads or salmon heads? Uh, I think maybe we should have done more uh, analysis also to answer that fully. Um, but the amino acid distribution was about the same for both of them. Um, and there was not that big differences in the, uh, the size distributions. Um, so actually they was quite similar except that they had uh, salmon, uh, the trout had more solubility of the proteins in the hydrolysates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. And okay. also the tile groups. Yes, tile but groups. But the rest was, was a bit, but, but also the, the trout heads are smaller um, and maybe it's a better, um, for the industry to utilize them because the bigger one has some market, but the smaller one doesn't have this market. So, yeah, that's a good reason actually. I, I agree for this. Uh, we have a next question from Rasa. How did antioxidant influence the yield of different fractions and especially emulsion? Um, uh, we didn't see any differences actually. Uh, and as I already told, there was no emulsion, uh, but um, there was no differences between the oil, um, uh, what we get of oil uh, and protein. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, but, but you had the maybe a, a really thin layer of emulsion, really thin layer. Yeah, right? but we didn't, yeah, really thin. Uh, yeah. But we didn't, we didn't, and it was not uh, during the whole uh, uh, surface. It was just small parts in the surface. Yeah, maybe so bubbles, maybe, yeah. Yeah, so we didn't measure this one. It was impossible to do, so. Yeah, but when you separate the fractions, it was impossible to separate, right? Yeah, it was, it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I assume, yeah, sometimes yeah. you get just a thin layer and it, it's not possible. Yeah, I mm -hmm. agree. Yeah, but did you get a lot of sludge? Uh, yes, but we didn't do anything with the sludge because okay. we didn't have time. And yes, so so you didn't analyze the oil content no. in the sludge. No, we didn't. But uh, the oil yield was about um, ninety percent, eighty, ninety percent, mm -hmm. compared to what we had in the in. Um, in the raw material, so it's only a smaller part. Uh, I think maybe 10 to 20 percent in this sludge. Mm. But you didn't display today, and therefore I wonder: Did you analyze also uh, total carbonyl content in your um, uh, no. hydro? No, no, so we just didn't. tile tile groups, right? Yeah, you because yes, in one of the trials we did it, uh, carbonyl groups, but there were any different there wasn't any differences. Okay, you mean uh, between the trout and salmon? No, we didn't, we didn't do that because we hadn't time uh, and this COVID came apart. So we did only did the tile groups. Okay. Yeah, okay. for the last one. So I didn't present the results today. Okay, yeah, very interesting. Thank you, Christina. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm checking if we have more questions. Yes, we have more questions from Revilla. But oh, but where it was measured the protein solubility in hydrolysate? Yes. Mm -hmm. So it the results you, you've presented was the hydrolysate. Yes. Mm -hmm. We also have the solubility in the raw material, but I didn't present that one. Okay. And the next question is from Rasa. Which raw material gives better uh, fish uh, protein hydrolysate yield? Uh, 
there wasn't any differences on the yield. It was about 80% for both of them. Yeah. So, so no it was the solubility that was different. But then your question, how water-soluble fish protein hydrolysate could become insoluble then? Uh, we, it, this is the thing we don't know. <laughs> I had the so, same, actually, I had the same question as Rasa. I was thinking yeah. to also to ask you. <laughs> but but we, we discussed this a lot and maybe, uh, as I already said, it, maybe it's the, the lipid uh, content in the raw material, but also there can, can be something that influences in the method uh, we are using, uh, something in the, in the uh, raw material. But, but yeah. how old how old was your raw material? Did you use fresh directly from the industry, right? Uh, directly from the industry. Okay. Um, but to be able to, because you can't you can't hydrolyze everything at once. So the only solution we had is to freeze it at minus yes. eighty. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But it was. Do. Yeah. Yeah, this is normal. This is uh, everyone is doing this. Yes, I, I was just thinking why about this water soluble fish protein hydrolysis. Maybe the raw material, but no, you said it was fresh, so I don't have any any ideas. Maybe Rasa has uh, any ideas from from your your huge experience with hydrolysis, but um, I'm still thinking. Yes, okay. Do we have more questions? No. So thank you again, Christina, for such an interesting presentation. Uh, and we, we are now going to have a pause, 10 minutes. Uh, we, uh, okay, according to our plan, we, uh, we should have it at 10.40, but now we have it at 10.30. So we leave more time for the next speakers. So uh, we have 10 minutes pause and we meet, uh, uh, we meet here in 10 minutes. Okay, so now we are back uh, and I would like uh, to present our next speaker, uh, Sophie Kendler from uh, the Department of Biotechnology and Food Sciences uh, at NTNU uh, in Trondheim. Uh, so your uh, PhD thesis uh, is uh, dedicated to uh, processing and quality aspects and consumer preferences of utilized uh, marine resources. Uh, so she will tell us uh, a bit more about this. Uh, so please, uh, Sophie, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Yana. Uh, can you see my uh, Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, as Yana said, uh, I'm Sophie. And I am a PhD candidate uh, within the Optimart project at NTNU here in Trondheim. And I am also part of the working group of BLUR, which means Little Utilized Marine Resources. And in this group, we are a working group of uh, five people, uh, including uh, two PhD candidates uh, and one postdoctoral candidate and two supervisors. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, as I uh, yeah, just want to mention before I start, I have just started my PhD a year ago, so I'm sure my uh, presentation is quite different from the ones before. But um, yeah, and I am not working with white fish and not with uh, restaurant materials, so I have my, my project is dedicated to uh, marine species that are not utilize that much right now. And uh, therefore our uh, overall aim of the project is to increase the utilization of these uh, little utilized marine resources for human consumption. And uh, in order to increase uh, this uh, utilization, we want to get knowledge about factors that affect um, the chemical co composition. Uh, for example, uh, if it makes a difference when this fish is caught, for example, so the seasonal variations uh, within the lipid or protein fractions, for example, but also processing properties like the drip loss or water holding capacity of the fillets, as well as consumer consum consumption preferences, uh, which product types would be interesting uh, for consumers, but of course also shelf life and uh, shelf stability, uh, including microbial load for example, so the microbiology is, microbiology is a big part of the project as well. 
and also processing technologies um, when it comes to packaging, filleting techniques, for example. And to reach this common goal of um, increasing the knowledge about these species, uh, this whole LORE project is a collaborative uh, project between me, Dionysius, uh, the other PhD candidate, and Eamon, who is our postdoctoral candidate. And uh, we, the three of us, all have our different uh, focuses um, in this uh, project. And my focus is on the chemistry, quality, and the nutritional aspects of this project. Um, but yeah, what are actually the species I am working with? Um, the species I work with, uh, or we are mostly interested in, is different flatfish species. And within the flatfish species family, uh, I have my main focus of interest uh, within European place, or I was better in Norwegian, as this is a very tasty uh, fish. And we think that it's uh, yeah, possible to increase the utilization of this fish. Uh, other flatfish species that we're also interested in are lemon sole, magrim, European flounder, or a bit more exotic, maybe a thornback ray or skate. And when I started my research or my, my project, um, I also had a look into yeah, the World Wide Web, and because I was uh, interested in uh, to see if there is already other interest in Norway as well uh, for increasing the utilization of flatfish. Um, and I found that that FOF, um, they had, uh, I think uh, the announcement was in, in spring, uh, they had uh, announced a project proposal, a grant for 3.5 million Norwegian kroners. Uh, which is dedicated to the increased utilization of uh, flatfish species, where they also want to look into different, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, different methods and to find out if it's possible to have a life catch and to have the fish on land, and also want to investigate on different slaughtering methods. So this is quite interesting, in my opinion. And another uh, newspaper article I found is uh, quite recently in uh, mid-May announced from half Washington's Institute. And they um, yeah, had a big success for the first time of uh, uh, since 50 years, I think, that they managed to breed uh, European, flan uh, European place. Um, so uh, this is uh, very promising, I think, because they have tried before to breed this fish, but they had a big rate of that uh, small fish and juvenile fish, so they didn't manage to breed it further into the adult stage. So, yeah, but coming to my project now, to my uh, project details, um, as I mentioned before, uh, my part in this big uh, lately utilized marine resources project is more on the chemical uh, characterization quality and also nutritional aspects of the fish. So this big uh, pizza slice here on the right side is one of the main topics in my project. And the second uh, main topic of my project is the holistic utilization and the possibilities of byproducts from flatfish species. As yeah, we have already heard from the other presentations, uh, it's a very relevant topic to valorize restaurant materials and to bring bring it back to the food chain. So um, yeah, uh, the first uh, working package or main package uh, was the characterization of European place. And therefore, we had a sampling in September, December, and April. We were extremely lucky that we were still able to conduct all these samplings during the corona pandemic. And we joined this uh, small uh, local fishing uh, boat near Olesen and uh, was able to join and get the experience um, on how this flatfish is caught. And in this first working package, I investigate on factors that affect the chemical composition, like seasonal variations. And I also had a look on physiochemical characteristics. So um, the main, the main, uh, the main anal analysis or main points that are interesting, uh, we are interested in is the proximate composition of the fish, since there's very little uh, yeah, knowledge in general about this flatfish species. So it's uh, just basic analysis when it comes to protein content, lipid content, ash and water content, of course, but then also a bit more detail about the lipid profile, 
which lipid classes uh, does this fish contain, and also the protein profile. Uh, next to it, I also investigate, um, actually doing this right now, is uh, environmental toxins like polychlorinated ethanols and uh, heavy metals, since uh, place is a bottom living fish, and therefore it might be more susceptible, uh, yeah, susceptible to uh, for this uh, environmental toxins. And the other aspect I'm looking into is a physiochemical analysis, like color, texture, water holding capacity, and trip loss, since this is also something this is like directly affecting uh, the consumer's choice. Because um, if the color is uh, rapidly changing to, of the fillet changing to a gray color, the, the consumer might not want to buy this fish because it's not looking that tasty. And yeah, and when we work with flatfish, we have to uh, just keep in mind that we don't have two fillets like we have with sake or uh, cod, for example, or salmon, but we have two uh, four fillets. So when we filleted this fish, we always got four different fillets uh, where we also tried to analyze the different um, positions. So we always used, uh, for the analysis, we always use parts of the belly fillet, but also of the, the upper body part, for example. Yeah, and I can show you some preliminary results, but I just want to mention here at this point again that I'm still in the middle of the experiments. So it's just to keep in mind to uh, these results are uh, not the end results, um, but uh, might give uh, already good uh, uh, information how what to expect. Um, yeah, so I investigated on the protein content per season <clears throat> in September, December, and April. And we can see here that the protein content uh, was the highest in the September catch. And it was decreasing uh, until 14, about 14% 14 in, in the April catch. So this uh, is already a significant difference between the September and the April catch. And this can also be seen in the lipids here. Uh, again, uh, lipid content per season. And we can see that in general, I should mention that uh, place is a very lean fish. So it's uh, not comparable, of course, with uh, salmon, for example, and also not comparable uh, with halibut. Halibut is a flat fish that has been uh, quite popular in the last years in Norway because it's also a very tasty fish. But halibut is um, a medium fatty fish, which contains about 80% lipids, but this is not the case for place. So um, yeah, we can see we have around, around 1.2 and 1.5% lipids in September and December, and a large drop and decrease in April. <clears throat> and also we could see that it's a large variety in December. And this might be because um, of the gender and the majority of the fish, because um, the spawning season is around uh, between around February until May. So that's also the reason why, <clears throat> sorry, why we wanted to include April to have like a more extreme season to see how this spawning season affects the fish. And you can see that the protein drops and the lipid drops a lot. <laughs> it's very different, uh, difficult to analyze uh, lipid content when there's almost no lipids in there. And yeah, and we can see that, for example, when we did the filleting in, in December uh, and we got female fish, we could see that the, the row was already very developed. It was a large part of, of the, the fish itself. So a lot of uh, energies uh, and uh, yeah, is um, yeah, devoted to the spawning season. And this can also be seen in the water content in the different fish per season. We see that there was the, less, the least water content in September and the highest water content in April, uh, which also gives us first uh, ideas about how the quality changes. Because if, the, if there's so much water content in the, in the fish, it also affects the texture. Uh, so it will be very uh, interesting to see once I have the texture analysis um, ready or the data ready to see 
how much uh, this uh, increased water content uh, affects the texture of the fish. Uh, but also uh, have some data ready from the drip plus because we did some storage trials um, with whole fish, a whole gutted fish on ice uh, around two, zero to uh, two degrees. And I measured the drip loss in, uh, after seven days and after 14 days. And you can see that in September, there was not a lot of drip loss. It was maximum 2% after 14 days. That's quite good, I would say. But then, uh, for example, in April, you can see that it's um, yeah very, very high already after seven days and even higher after 14 days which is also in agreement with the higher water content and the less uh, nutrients in, in the fillet. Yeah, but um, getting back to uh, my overview here again and coming to the second big part of my project, uh, which I am at the moment uh, defining more or less because I will uh, yeah, work with this at the beginning of, of next year. Um, Yes, so uh, when we collected the fish, or when we had the sampling of the fish in September, December, and April, uh, we also collected and kept the rest raw material, meaning we kept the viscera, the backbone, including the head and the skin. And first results show that we had around 55% of rest raw material uh, from this uh, place. So it's uh, again, uh, around 50% that would be discarded and would become waste or low value products. So uh, in our opinion, it's very important to see and to identify availabilities and possibilities of these different fractions of this flat fish. What are the species specific possibilities? How can we valorize um, this restaurant material, for example? And therefore this next uh, package, working package, uh, will be a mixture between uh, basic chemical analysis to identify the lipid profile, the protein profile, and also oxidation degradation components, but also an extensive literature research. Yes. Um, and just to mention as well, I, this uh, spoilage microorganism and shelf life is a uh, part of the Museus to Callas uh, PhD work, where I am also involved in it. And he also looked into uh, vacuum packaging and map packaging of, of uh, this place fillets. And these two, these two pizza slides here are still very open and we have to define in the near future how we will proceed with this. Yeah, but uh, coming to the last slide already, uh, giving you a short uh, yeah, outlook uh, uh, of the future work and ideas we have in the project. So uh, this uh, first point, the chemical and physicochemical characterization of flatfish species is quite similar to what I have done or what I'm still doing right now with PLACE. I uh, have a master's student who will start next week uh, that will investigate on the chemical composition of the other flatfish species we collected, like lemon sole and flounder and magrim. And in, beginning of, in the beginning of 2022, there will also be a master student working on the chemical characterization of the rest raw material we collected. And I will uh, yeah, work on, on um, identifying a possible uh, yeah, valorization possibilities for this uh, yeah, rest raw material. Yes, um, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, yeah, I will probably have more results available in the next couple of months. Um, yeah, so feel free to contact me. Thank you very much, Sophie, for your nice presentation. Uh, reg regardless of the fact that you're at the beginning of your PhD studies, I think you presented a quite comprehensive uh, overview of what you're doing and what you're going to do in the future. Uh, and it was uh, very interesting for us. So we have um, uh, several questions. Um, okay, there was one in the in the chat, but I, it kind of disappeared. I don't know why. Uh, okay, that's really. Yeah, I, I see it here. I see uh, lipid content results from the whole fish. Yes, um, yes, this one. Yes, so yeah. lipid con results from the whole fish. Yes. 
No, uh, I have to mention here that we only now, for now, we only looked into uh, the fillets, but we also kept whole fish uh, frozen at minus 80 because we want to uh, also investigate the proximal composition of the whole of the whole fish. So that will be done as well. So those 1%, 2% are from the whole fish, from the fillets? It's only from the fillet, yes. Mm. So it's very lean fish, right? It is an extremely lean fish and it's, uh, yeah, especially with the samples from April, it's very difficult to extract lipids for further lipid analysis. But yeah, it's also a very tasty fish. I can oh tell. yeah, <laughs> did you, did you uh, taste it? Yeah, we were lucky enough to have uh, too many samples in September and December. <laughs> so we could uh, spare some for uh, our own consumption. <laughs> now I want to, to taste it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have next question. Will you fractionate rest raw material for chemical and technological analysis as viscera and skins plus bones can be different? Um, yeah, um, that's a very good question. I think we are not sure for now how we will um, do that or what exactly we're gonna do. For now, we kept all the restaurant material fractions uh, differently. So we have uh, bags with all the viscera and with bags with all the backbone, and we kept the skin separately. And the first step will just be basic analysis on yeah the lipid, the protein content, uh, and uh, some degradation, oxidation components. So, but it's a very good question. I will. Uh, write it down for <laughs> for my project to look into what we're going to do. Where do you usually get fish, Sophie? In the market? Ah, yeah, no, uh, we uh, we had this uh, small uh, collaboration or collaboration with the smaller uh, local fishery uh, near Olesun. So ah, we actually drove our neighbors. Uh, to yes. Okay. <laughs> in at uh, Haroya and Finoya for uh -huh. fishing there. It's a very local, uh, small, uh, yeah, boat. But they they go out for uh, flatfish um, fishing in between the seasons of the other fish they catch. So we were extremely lucky to to get the flatfish there, because I, from what I have heard is that um, flatfish is mainly bycatch in the big trawlers. So it wouldn't be so easy to to get. Uh, no. No, therefore I ask you. It's, yeah. Yes, I also mm -hmm. wondered, but maybe in the market you can find the fish. Yeah, uh, occasionally you get it at Mimi, for example, or probably if you ask a supplier like Dumstein, you could, could order uh, larger amounts. But it was very valuable for me personally as well to join this fishing boat to yeah, get it first hand. <laughs> But is it a big fish? How many kilos uh, does it it's, have? It's uh, first a varies a lot. The female fish is bigger, of course, but it's like uh, 30, no, not 30, uh, 40 centimeters uh, big, I would say. And kilos are uh, two to three kilograms, for example. So it's, yeah. Like medium salmon, okay. Yeah, like medium, yeah. But uh, definitely, uh, less weight than salmon i would say and uh it's also uh, the filleting is a bit tricky it's a very thin fillet of course because it's a flat fish and also so this is something that has to be optimized as well in the future that it's not too many cutoffs and trimmings that get lost yeah, yeah. that's true Amazing. Okay, uh, we don't have um, other questions. So thank you again for your nice presentation. And I wish you good luck in your PhD studies and uh, research and investigations. So uh, we are going to the next speaker. This is uh, Sherry Stephanie Chan. And uh, she's also from the Department of Biotechnology and Food Sciences. And uh, she will um, uh, talk a bit uh, about the effect of super chilling on um, processability and water holding properties from fresh to processed Atlantic salmon. Uh, so I, I guess, Sherry, you're now on your third or second year. I don't remember. I think third year, right? Yeah, I'm in my final year. So. Uh... Yeah, so you have a lot of information to talk about. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jana. 
and I will share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you to the committee for inviting me to uh, share my uh, PhD project. So uh, my name is Sherry, and uh, today I'll be talking about the effect of super chilling on processability and water holding properties from fresh to processed salmon. And uh, my project is has been a collaboration with the uh, NTNU and also Nofima in Stavanger and also uh, the Technical University of Denmark from yeah, Denmark. And uh, just a little bit of background information. Uh, the definition of water holding properties is that they include drip loss and also water holding capacity. And both are very important uh, properties for fish quality. And as we know, water is an important component in foods and they can be classified into different uh, types of water based on the location and the mobility inside the muscle. Um, yeah, for drip loss, uh, they are mainly uh, occurring because of the change capacity of muscle with the extrusion of water, so water is lost, and also other components like water-soluble proteins, vitamins, and minerals. And they are also known as purge or weep in some of the literatures. Um, and also since uh, in the industry, since fish is sold by weight in kilograms, a high drip loss is often undesirable because they uh, quicken the hydrolytic and, and oxidative reactions. And so they directly influence the industry's profi profitability. And of course, a high drip loss in the packaging can also uh, induce uh, bacterial growth. Um, and uh, sensorically not very nice to see inside the packaging if there is a high drip loss. Uh, for the water holding capacity, it is the ability of the muscle to hold the uh, inherent and the uh, added water. And they are often related to different uh, quality parameters, such as texture and also juiciness. And uh, a high water holding capacity is preferred because it means that the muscle is able to hold the uh, water, which often also correlates to increased juiciness. And uh, just a little bit about uh, the concept of super chilling. Super chilling uh, here is defined as uh, keeping the temperature of the core muscle, core fish muscle between traditional chilling and freezing. And uh, we have probably heard a lot about super chilling, but they are mostly focused on fresh fillets, such as uh, this in the picture, where uh, an ice layer is formed on the top of the surface of the fillet. Uh, and uh, through time, this uh, ice will seep through the muscle and equi equilibrate. Um, but another type of super chilling is through refrigerated seawater tanks, or in short, RSV. And they are commonly used in the pelagic industries now for chilling, for example, pelagic fish like mackerel, herring, and seal. And they are used to store uh, large volumes of uh, fish on board fishing vessels. So this is like an example of uh, RSV tanks in on board the vessel. And um, currently, uh, when I started my PhD, there was a new fish slaughter method that was introduced in the aquaculture industry. Um, and this is the picture of uh, the Norwegian gannet, which is the new fish slaughter method. And what uh, this fish vessel does is um, they pump the fish from the fish cage directly through the, to this vessel by the sea cage, so the vessel is parked just beside the sea cage, and they pump it directly on board the vessel and bleed and cut the fish, and then super chill them directly under zero degrees in uh, RSV tanks. So the vessel is equipped with um, a full facilities for slaughtering of fish. And this condenses the traditional three stage handling process into only one because the traditional stage of slaughter is to pump the fish um, from the sea cage to a well boat, and the well boat has to transport the, the fish to uh, landing facilities in waiting cages before they can be slaughtered uh, in land-based facilities for some days after. And currently, uh, since this is a new concept of uh, 
of a slaughter method and also chilling in RSV tanks. Uh, there are limited studies examining this new concept of super chilling gutted fish from direct cage slaughter up to the whole value chain until it's uh, packed and cold smoked. Um, and I studied also uh, different types of vacuum packaging. And basically vacuum packaging, the main concept is to increase shelf life and they, because they remove oxygen. And so they inhibit growth of aerobic spoilage microorganisms so they can prolong the freshness of food. Um, and on the left here, we see that the fish are traditionally vacuum packaged, which we often see in the stores. And on the right picture here, the fish, the portions are vacuum skin package, which is another type of uh, vacuum packaging where the fish is laid on the tray and uh, the upper film is uh, directly attached to, to the product. And you see that there are no wrinkles or air bubbles here. So it promotes uh, aesthetic appearance and is often linked to a premium quality product. So um, basically the objectives of my PhD is uh, summed up in this figure and um, is to compare the difference between RSV versus traditional ice uh, whole gutted fish storage until they are filleted and uh, in one portion, they are uh, portioned and they are packaged and stored. And the other value chain is that they are dry salted, cold smoked, packaged and stored. So I looked at two different value chains. Uh, but for this presentation, I will be giving my two last experiments where the first was to combine the effect of whole fish storage method on RSV and ice and the different packaging techniques. Uh, in vacuum skin and traditional vacuum. And the next study that I did was to compare the quality of cold smoked salmon uh, from RSV or ice storage subjected to different dry salting times. And uh, through these different dry salting times, I, we uh, developed a model to predict the temperature and water and salt profiles during the dry salting of salmon using the software console multiphysics. So for the first uh, um, experiment that I will present here, um, the summary was that uh, we took 84 fish uh, from a local slaughterhouse in uh, nearby Stavanger, and they're already gutted. So um, we split them into two groups, which one is the RSV group and one is the ice group. So the RSV group, we actually created an RSV tank here uh, because of corona restrictions, we couldn't do it on board a vessel, so we uh, created our own uh, uh, makeshift seawater tank instead and had it stored in the laboratory. So we kept the temperature of this tank uh, in minus one degrees for four days, and after the fourth day, uh, this tank was drained and the fish were kept on ice. And on day seven, they were filleted and portioned. Um, here. So each fillet was portioned into three pieces and they were split into skin packaging or vacuum packaging. So total there are uh, four groups, RS, which means that uh, it's stored in RSV and skin packaged, RV, which means that they are stored in RSV and traditional vacuum packaged, and IS and IB. Yeah, so we had uh, uh, a lot of portions, fillet portions that were pack packaged and we did a shelf life study. So we followed the fish um, for, for uh, two weeks and did the sampling continuously um, every fifth day, I would say. And this is the, a picture of an illustration of uh, where we did the sampling. So we did microbiology, we did water holding capacity, drip loss, color, texture, and pH. So um, I will just show some of the results, uh, not all results, but some of the results um, that we got. Um, so basically here, uh, day zero is the slaughter day and day 25 is the last day of sampling after packaging. So what we saw that the pH generally decreased, which um, is natural because of uh, anaerobic glycolysis. And we saw that the RSV fish for uh, either vacuum or skin package, they have a little bit lower pH than the iced package. But the packaging technique 
doesn't really have a significant uh, difference. And um, since the fish were stored in RSV, we expected some weight gain, water and salt uptake. So um, this was uh, translated to our results. So the, basically the weight gain of the whole fish after four days in, in uh, RSV days um, gained for about 1.6 percent in weight and after that after the rsv was drained and stored in ice they decreased uh, in weight so the overall weight gain after seven days of whole fish storage was, was about um, 0 0.9 percent while the control group the ice fish it generally remained stable at the 0 0.1 percent and for the drip loss and water holding capacity uh, it was very interesting to see that um, the whole fish storage doesn't really have a difference in the drip loss through storage time, but the packaging technique had a significant difference. So um, those that were skin packaged uh, here on the top of the graph, uh, they had a higher drip loss than the traditional vacuum packaging. And this has affected the, the color of the fillets so the skin packaged fish were actually lighter and uh, lesser reddish and lesser yellowish in color. Um, and also the water holding capacity, there was no difference between the four groups after packaging and they generally decreased through time. But if we look at the whole fish storage and on day seven here, uh, it shows that the RSV fish had a higher water holding capacity than the ice fish. And we also did a similar experiment uh, before, and it also showed similar results that the RSV fish, when they were stored whole inside the RSV, they had the higher water holding capacity. Um, and we also did microbial growth, so, uh, and uh, some predictive modeling. Um, here I will present the microbial growth for hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria. Uh, generally, it showed that the RSV fish here had a longer lag time for the hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria, which is a uh, spoilage bacteria giving uh, off flavors for the fish. So um, they had a longer lag time and uh, they had the lower maximum population growth. So it is, uh, there is a potential to, to say that um, RSV storage could increase the microbial shelf life of the, the fish. And for our next uh, experiment regarding the cold smoking of salmon, uh, this experiment is already published here. And just to give a short summary of it, it uh, is more or less similar to the previous experiment where the fish were separated into RSV and ice. And on day four, they were portioned into these uh, portions. Uh, so they were standardized, standardized in size in portions. And uh, the next day they were dry salted uh, at zero degrees. And uh, we had an interval of the dry salting time from three hours to 21 hours at a specific interval of uh, three hours. And uh, the next day they were all uh, washed and cold smoked with the same uh, cold smoking procedure at 22 degrees. And they were packaged and stored at four degrees for 12 days before we sampled them. So um, we sampled them on day 19. And here is an illustration on uh, what we did with the sampling here. So we uh, weighed the drip loss and color and measured the water activity and water holding capacity and water content as well as the texture. So for the modeling experiment, this is uh, an illustration of how the heat and the mass transfer occurs within the dry salting of salmon. So the dry salting was in a cold room at zero degrees. So heat actually flows out of the muscle and the dry salt uh, uh, goes in from the surface of the muscle into the, 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 mus uh, the salmon muscle. And the water from the muscle would uh, naturally flow out since salt is floating in. And what we did in the model using ComSol model physics is that uh, we put input parameters of uh, the salmon fish, such as different boundary conditions and um, thermal properties uh, of the fish. 
and we use this to predict the temperature change and during the dry salting. And when we have gotten the predictions of temperature, we use this as an input to predict the water and salt uptake um, in a mass transfer model. So after this prediction of water and salt uptake, we use these uh, values to put in into a water activity model to predict the water activity. And uh, this is the final output. And uh, in this experiment, it's, uh, it wasn't only modeling that we did, we also measured uh, different quality parameters. Uh, so basically what we saw with the drip loss is that uh, with increasing salting time, the drip loss increases, which is um, expected. Because as you, added more, as you add more salt, uh, the salting out process uh, occurs and uh, more water is evaporated. Um, but what we see is that the, uh, the greatest difference between in the drip loss is actually after cold smoking, which is the red uh, graph here. And after two weeks of storage, there wasn't a much increase in drip loss. Um, and there were no difference between the RSV or ice fish. Uh, but on the water holding capacity, it was very difficult to see a trend here with the different salting times and there was no significant difference um, between the RSV or ice fish or the different salting types. So um, this is a picture of uh, how we did the temperature profile. So we put, um, this is the fillet portions uh, where we standardize the sizes and the thickness. Um, and we put temperature probes inside some of the fishes to predict the core temperature. So here the model actually predicts temperature quite well. The model is the blue line and uh, yeah, from the RMSV values, we actually had very low RMSV values, which means that uh, the fit is uh, rather good. And um, uh, for the salt and concentration distribution, uh, COMSOL is actually very useful to, to give a spatial, visualization of how the salt and water moves within the muscle. And here I just chose zero hour, 10 hours and 21 hours. So the salt concentration increases through the muscle um, uh, through increasing salting time while the water content decreases. Um, and from here, the, the picture here is a picture of for the RSV fish. Uh, and the picture below is for the ice fish. And uh, as you can see here, there is no significant differences between the RSV fish or the ice fish in terms of salt and water content for, from the experiments. And uh, here we can see that uh, for both models, the salt and the water content, they uh, gave pretty good fits for uh, the RSV fish and the ice fish. So all the RMSV values were also quite uh, low here. Um, and yeah, for lastly, for the water activity profile, we noticed that uh, in the experiment, the RSV fish had a lower water activity in the samples. And uh, uh, in numerical modeling, in the, uh, based on the predictions that we got from the heat and mass transfer profiles, the uh, model predicted quite well as well for the RSV and the ICE uh, model through increasing salting times. So as we also expected through increasing salting times, the water activity decreases. Yeah, so the RMSV values were very low here. Um, and an overall conclusion for both of the studies, or actually two of the last studies that I carried out, um, there is water and salt uptake when storing fish and RSV systems. So um, what we saw was that there was a salt uptake of 0.3% for RSV systems uh, after seven days of storage. And there were minimal differences in drip loss and water holding capacity between fillets from uh, the RSV versus the ice fish. And skin packaging generally gave a higher drip loss than vacuum packaging, and this also affected the color regardless of the whole fish storage method. Um, the RSV fish, they gave a uh, lower hydrogen sulfide producing bacterial growth and also lower water activity after smoking. 
And there is also an inverse relationship between the water loss and salt uptake during dry salting. And uh, in general, uh, the mathematical model that we did in COMSOL, uh, they agreed with the measured and simulated temperature and as well as the salt and water content uh, and water activity. So in general, numerical modeling is a useful tool that can predict the state variables like the spatial uh, variation within the muscle as a function of space and time. And there is also a lot of uh, parameters uh, you can include inside the model and uh, lessen the experimental time. But the most important in modeling is that uh, it's validated and it should be robust. So um, yeah, thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any more questions, uh, you can always email me. So yeah. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Sherry, for such a nice presentation. And we have some questions already. So uh, microbial growth, which parameters did you analyze for? Um, we actually analyzed uh, three parameters. We analyzed the uh, total psychotropic counts, uh, mesophilic counts, and also the hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria. So um, in, we actually did a couple of studies with, uh, comparing RSV and iced fish. And what we see is that the hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria is generally lower for the RSV fish. Yes, I was amazed by the number of uh, experiments you have conducted. It's really, uh, yes, amazing and a very comprehensive study. But what I was thinking about, you know, uh, this refrigerated seawater, um, you know, um, okay, there are okay some, some discussions, but uh, do you consider that refrigerated seawater is super chilling? Because super chilling, the definition of super chilling is a bit different, you know? So how in, in your own studies, do you consider refrigerated seawater as a part of super chilling or a separate technique? I think it would be a part of super chilling, but uh, as you say, super chilling, um, there are many different definitions of super exactly. chilling. Yeah, because um, you can super chill whole fish and you can uh, super chill by ice crystallization, for example, on the fillets. And there are also many methods, but uh, here we define super chilling as keeping the temperature in between uh, conventional chilling and freezing, so below zero degrees. Yeah. Yes, that's that's how I am saying also to my students. So this is between the conventional chilling and super chilling, and this is refrigerated uh, sea, uh, refrigerated sea water, uh, and therefore. And also um, last year we were developing your opinion start standard with EFSA and uh, we kept refrigerated seawater apart from super chilling because for the refrigerated seawater you have standards actually, but for super chilling you didn't have standards before. So therefore this, this definition, you know, it's a kind of red zone, you know, but yeah, so we, right. we keep it, yes, we keep it apart. But yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And um, are you going to publish some more papers on this? Uh, just to follow, just to check, you know? Uh, yeah, the first uh, experiment that I just uh, recently uh, presented is actually under revision, or I have submitted a revised version. So I'm crossing my fingers that. Uh, yes, good luck. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but um, I, I just wonder, since you're collaborating with the industry, what um, uh, is the industry most interested in uh, as parameters, quality parameters, like uh, water holding capacity, color, or, okay, micro, microbiology? What is the primary factors for the industry? Um, I would say is uh, the water holding properties, how much water it can take and how much salt it actually taken up and how it will affect the taste, of course, because it uh, ultimately is for the consumers. So we actually did a study on sensory. Uh, I didn't present it here, but um, uh, it was a sensory panel with the uh, chefs and what they 
uh, significantly tasted was that the RSV fish is a little bit uh, saltier than the iced fish. So uh, the, I think that was a very interesting result, but uh, a part of that, it's very comparable to the traditional method of uh, iced fish. Mm. Yes. Uh, but um, what is the storage time for that vacuum packed fish that you showed? The, the, the super chill and vacuum packed fish. What is the storage time normally? I wonder as a uh, consumer. Uh, we stored for about maximum of three weeks. And after that, it's uh, 19 days we stored for. Oh, in, in the cold room, right? Yeah, in the cold room at four degrees, but uh, that was uh, too long, I think. Okay, but what was about microbiology after week three? Was it still okay? Uh, I think it was about six, seven logs. I don't really have the numbers now, but uh, it was uh, it was uh, spoiled already. Ah, okay, okay. But mm -hmm. um, when you consider the fish is still safe after week one, after two, week two because you analyzed. Mm. Do you think it's uh, after week one is still okay? Yeah, week one is okay. Or after seven days uh, after filleting, because it also depends on when we fillet the, the fish. So in this experiment, we filleted on day seven and uh, after one week, it's still okay. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you for your really interesting presentation. And uh, I also want to thank all the speakers for today's um, session. Uh, you really enriched our webinar. And I'm really happy to have this wide um, uh, spectrum uh, of uh, different topics. Uh, so now we will go to our discussion and closing um, uh, stage of this webinar. So do you have, Yanita, to say something? Yeah, I think we today have touched upon some uh, issues that sets the use of marine ingredients in a broader perspective, as you say. Uh, it's all about the fishermen and what the, what the regulations and, and also about the different methods of bringing higher value out of the fish. Uh, and it's very complex. Uh, I'm impressed by the uh, presenters today. Uh, and I'm also happy to see we have had a lot of good questions from the audience. Yeah. Um, so uh, and it's also been interesting to look uh, upon uh, the utilization of uh, the fish that is not utilized today and how the quality varies uh, during the year. It's very interesting. Um, and I hope that uh, the audience has uh, like me, learn something new today, uh, and that we will uh, meet again in uh, uh, next webinars. Yeah. Mm. I also learned a lot of new information. Mm. It's never too late to learn something new. Mm. And uh, I think I can use it also in my teaching and mm. research. Uh, I want to ask uh, all the um, listeners if they have any questions, it's still time to ask the questions now uh, to our participants. Uh, but uh, uh, if not, um, I want uh, to say that um, I was really um, uh, surprised by the new information that was given today at the webinar. Uh, and um, uh, the quality of presentations, uh, uh, the, the um, interactive uh, presentations uh, given uh, were also, oh, we have some questions. Uh, okay, it's not a question, it's a comment. Thank you for an interesting webinar. I think, you know, when uh, we organize webinars with a PhD student that can present practical, uh, practical uh, work, it's more interesting, maybe more relaxed, and uh, still it's um, like questions under, uh, under analysis, right? And um, the research under development. So it's still something that, uh, um, under development, so it's uh, very, very, um, very, very interesting for all of us. 
Uh, and uh, it's something that uh, maybe um, experienced researchers are afraid of dealing with because you start a new topic, maybe it will not be su successful. And also, for example, when we have a project, uh, we mostly um, put something that, uh, on, put the base that is already, uh, okay, experience area, right? Uh, but here, the PhD work is something that you can uh, where you can have your creativity. So it's very interesting to, to listen to. Uh, so uh, I think then, no, if no questions, uh, we can close our webinar. Uh, and uh, uh, you can always uh, ask and send messages to our uh, participants. Uh, and uh, if you have uh, any ideas for collaboration with our participants, I think it's also a good idea, a good starting point. Uh, so with this, uh, uh, I'm um, closing my part of this webinar. Do we have something to say, uh, Janita, before we close the session? No, I think it's just say, uh, have a nice uh, day for on and hope to see you again. Yes. And again, thank you again for all the participants for such an interesting input. We enjoyed, we enjoyed. I, I'm sure our listeners enjoyed as well. So I wish a good day to all of you. I hope it will be sunny today. <laughs> now it's raining, but good day to all of you. Bye.